So welcome all to the today's uh, training event of Graspo OS. Uh, the topic of today's meeting is leveraging of ERAS metrics, so we impact uh, of open access books. Now we can, uh, we're going to tell some uh, introduction for our speakers. Um, is our um, Maxim Kupreyev, if I pronounce it actually uh, right, with the 15 years plus of experience in information management in industrial and academic context, Maxim serves a, a, as a technical manager at Operas. He oversees the scientific and technical coordination of Operas projects and takes care of its core infrastructure and its uh, services portfolio. Uh, we have also Fots Mistakopoulos, uh, who serves a, as a project policy officer for Opera's research, research infrastructure, contributing to the GRASP OS and Skill for EOS projects to promote the adoption of open science practices. He also an active participant in multiple co arab working groups, supporting efforts to reform research assessment. Uh, from Opera's, we have also Carol uh, Del Mazo with a background in journalism, uh, science communication, and training. She serves as a service, ma um, service market and communi a community outreach officer at the Opera Research Infrastructure and integrates communication, user outreach, and training strategy in diverse European projects such as RASP OS, Atrium, and Skills for EOSC. Now, also, we have and the Ubiquity Press. So, we have Rowan and Christian Garcia. With the first one, um, who is a developer at the Ubiquiti Press, where he has involved in the early stages of the development and integration of the Opera's metrics. Now, um, a short description of our agenda for today. The session will begin with an overview of Opera's metrics, highlighting its key features and benefits, including its role in aggregating data from different sources to provide a comprehensive view of a OA book usage. It will also cover how Opera's metrics fits into broader research assessment practices, addressing the open science aware perspective of the GRASP OS project. In the second part now, uh, we have a session that will be a hands-on technical training where participants will receive a step-by-step -step guidance on how to install and effectively use Opera's metrics. Um, some more additional information. Uh, the, this training session uh, is recorded. And the recorded and presentation will be shared with, um, with the links through your email. So you can now start and share your screen. Thank you all. Thank you for the introductions, uh, um, Zenia. Um, so uh, my name is Fotis. Hello, everyone. Uh, I think I speak on behalf of, of the Operas team and the GRASPOS uh, colleagues. We're very happy to have you here today. I see some familiar faces in the audience, so uh, feel free to jump in and correct me if you if you hear me see, saying something something wrong. So we will be monitoring the chat. So your input will also be uh, very uh, valuable. Uh, so today the focus is on Opera's metrics, as we said. Um, but before we jump in and talk about the service specifically, let's uh, just listen a little bit about the surrounding uh, environment and landscape of our open access books and how that uh, relates to research assessment. So uh, first, as a quick overview of the GRASPOS project. So we are developing an open infrastructure effectively uh, that is going to produce next generation research metrics and indicators. Um, as part of the infrastructure, we will have data, tools, services, and guidance, uh, guidance in the form of checklists, templates, uh, which, and all of these are informed by the uh, Open Science Assessment Framework which effectively translates uh, the open science principles and the responsible research assessment principles into practice. We have a very diverse uh, consortium uh, made of 18 partners. And uh, the key thing to know here is that there is expertise from uh, across the board in data management, open access, scholarly communication, and of course, research evaluation. So we will try to answer two questions today, uh, just to introduce you to the topic, why open access books and why Opera's metrics? Uh, I will mostly focus on the why open access books. Um, and uh, to begin with, we need to address the components around the GRASPOS project, which is an open science aware responsible risk assessment. And ef effectively, we're trying to bring the, the focus on open science and how it can be included in uh, research evaluation. And of course, open access is a key component of this conversation. So I hope this makes it very clear why open access is important in this conversation. 
Uh, but also GraspOS is one of the few projects that you see around in uh, from Horizon Europe funding uh, projects that effectively it's a response to uh, an over-reliance to quantitative metrics. So this is a criticism uh, for, the over for using too much the general impact factor or the hate index in the research assessment. Um, and that becomes an issue. Uh, and uh, what we're trying to do is find solution to these problems uh, as this I described earlier. And uh, what is the aim of the uh, RRA movement? Uh, effectively to make research assessment more diverse, inclusive, uh, equitable, and, uh, and just demonstrate the, the breadth and depth of uh, activities of researchers, which is, goes far beyond just publishing research articles. Research articles. And uh, what about open access books uh, and uh, specific disciplines? Uh, there is a lot of emphasis from the social science and humanities that we need to make sure that um, uh, open access books and books in general are more visible in research evaluations because this is a, a fundamental way by which uh, SSH uh, scholars publish. Uh, but uh, just uh, a little bit more about the RRA movement, because as I said, it's important to grasp OS. Uh, in my mind, so how do we go beyond uh, journals? And uh, effectively, in my mind, Dora answered uh, or posed one question uh, early on in 2012, how uh, do we assess uh, researchers and research? And they said, you know, we have to go beyond publication metrics and uh, move away from these indicators I mentioned earlier and just focus more on the content and not on where someone publishes. And uh, they make the first mention to uh, bring more uh, outputs into the conversation, such as data and software. Uh, and the movement, of course, developed over the next uh, 10 years, since 2012. Uh, and Co Coara, in 2022, uh, introduced another uh, uh, agreement uh, with 10 commitments. And I will focus on, on the first two commitments, which are more relevant, I think, to this session today. Uh, which is to recognize the diversity of contributions and careers in research. And uh, of course, the diversity of contributions include uh, things that go beyond the journal article. And for us, uh, books uh, here become even more relevant. And of course, uh, very relevant to today, uh, any research assessment exercise, uh, Quara says, should be, uh, should be done primarily through peer review, uh, but also supported by uh, quantitative indicators such as metrics. Uh, so we are not arguing to remove metrics altogether. It's mostly to understand how we can make uh, better use of metrics and use them more responsibly. So I hope by this point, uh, we can agree that uh, evaluating open access books is relevant to this conversation. Um, uh, but there are also some issues, some challenges, if you like, uh, that um, the infrastructure around open access books makes it a, a bit challenging to how to assess them. Um, and the open access infrastructure for books is fragmented effectively and less centralized than uh, those for journals. Uh, it's not the same ecosystem as the journal market where research is concentrated on a few key journals. Uh, commercial databases are also highly selective and provide only limited representation of the thematic and linguistic diversity found in scholarly publishing across geographical scholarly communication uh, communities. Uh, and also another challenge that people are facing is that they are expected to publish with certain publishers. This is down to the criteria that uh, specific uh, institutions or countries have for which publishers you must publish with. And this is a prestige economy, uh, much as uh, we have in the journals uh, domain. Uh, and I, I think this kind of prestige economy does not do justice to the diversity of research, diversity of publishers that we have in book publishing, and also, as I said already, to the diversity of languages that you can find in book publishing. Um, so uh, if we revert to sources uh, such as the Book Citation Index, let's say, or Scopus, uh, which primarily index English language publishers, uh, then we effectively come to the same problems that we have with uh, journal publishing. And uh, we limit and we make a very narrow picture of, of the publication landscape. And, and therefore, we need to find more types of uh, sources and databases where we can dive into and understand um, the readership, the audience that we can have for open access books. And, and those sources, we must find a way to create criteria for them to be included in evaluation exercises. Uh, and what about policies? I think uh, so far we have had uh, many uh, policies that uh, address the open access journals uh, and open access uh, publications uh, for research articles. 
But within those um, policies, we did not have specific mentions for open access books, although there has been calls, many, many calls, and uh, the, the, I think the landscape is improving. So far, we, we haven't had the, the, the same response for open access books. And, uh, but uh, it's not all doom and gloom. Of course, uh, there is uh, the infrastructure around supporting open access book publishing is developing. Uh, this is uh, some of the initiatives that I know of. It's in my periphery. I do apologize if, if something is really important and I haven't included it, but uh, honestly, it's it's something, it's the things that um, come, came to my mind, let's say, uh, to begin with, from what I know. Uh, feel free to add in the chat if there are any other initiatives that you think are important for people to know. Uh, all I want to point out is that you see here a diversity of, of initiatives that include, for example, an indexing platform in the OIB, uh, a monitoring, uh, another monitoring service in books analytics service, uh, policies uh, and how Palomera has tried to um, highlight uh, how to improve uh, open access policies, uh, books for open, policies for open access books. And of course, TOT, uh, which is addressing the, uh, the gap on how we manage uh, uh, metadata for open access books. And the second question I want to, and this I will close this presentation with this question, is why Opera's metrics? And I want, uh, we mentioned Quara, Dora, but there's also the Barcelona Declaration on Open Research Information, which uh, we also hosted the conversation on this topic uh, on the 13th of November here uh, from the community of practice. And effectively, what the Barcelona Declaration is calling for is to make sure that the uh, information that is used in evaluation uh, exercises is open and transparent and can be uh, accessed by both the evaluator and the, the assessor and the assessed. Uh, and uh, so how do we make this transition uh, from closed to open infrastructures? And I would like to point here something that Natalia Manola, CEO, uh, of, uh, the CEO of Open Air, said uh, something last week in, uh, in a talk that she gave in the World Science Forum. And she said very accurately and aptly that uh, although we encourage everyone to practice open science practices, we still evaluate people from closed proprietary sources. And we really need to move towards open community-led infrastructures. And uh, my last point here is that uh, the type of evaluation that we do and the resources that we use in the evaluations should reflect the output and the research activity. And as I already pointed out, and I think you'll see some information about it a little bit later as well, is that um, uh, the databases and the sources that can be used in, in, uh, to, to, to find information about open access books is diverse, it's developing, and therefore we should not be limited only to use one or two uh, commercial databases, but we should find alternatives. And that's where Opera's metrics fits. And just to make it clear, I'm not, we're not saying that we are replacing uh, anything here, but we are also part one, uh, one part of the equation. So uh, that's all from me. Uh, I hope that was clear. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and I will pass on the presentation now um, to Carol to introduce you to uh, Opera's Metrics. Thank you, Fortis. Thank you everyone for being here with us today. Now I'm gonna talk briefly about the main features and benefits of Opera's Metrics. Before we talk about specifically Opera's Metrics, it's important to place these services in the context where it is so metrics is part of the Opera's service catalog. And then another important context, what is Opera's? So for the ones who don't know, Opera's is a research infrastructure that focuses on open scholarly communication in the social sciences and humanities. So we offer services that help to improve how researchers share knowledge. We want to make open science more accessible and impactful. In the end, what we want is to empower scholars to innovate and collaborate and do science in a more open way. Currently, in our catalog, we have diverse services, uh, starting from discovery services. For example, we have GoTriple, which is a multilingual platform where you can find almost 17 million documents, mainly in open access from the social science and humanities, lots of publications. Pathfinders is another service, discovery service. In this case, if you want to publish something, the service can guide you finding the best editorial services that fit what you need when you want to publish something of your, your, your work. We also have a research for society services, and the first one is Vera. Vera is a collaborative platform to make projects in citizen science. So you can find partners, you can find funding, you can work together and manage projects of citizen science in VERA. Hypothesis, it's an interesting way to breed scientists 
through academic blogging. It's a very interesting uh, service as well. We also have PRISM. When you talk about quality assurance services and with PRISM, and we had a webinar about PRISM uh, six months ago through the Grasp OS project. You can also access this, uh, this webinar. PRISM can show us uh, how peer review process is being done for open access books. But the goal today is metrics. It's our analytics services. And then I'm going to explain a little bit about metrics for you. When you talk about metrics, we have to think of a database of usage and impact of open access books. It was designed thinking of the social science and humanities. And thus, there are diverse metrics and outer metrics that are gathered to have this full picture of the usage and impact of open access books. So I separated six, six key features to talk to for you. The first one and very important is the diversity in the data collection. So the metrics, out metrics are collected from various sources. You can know the number of reads in Google Books, downloads in different platforms. You have out metrics from social media. So you can have a clear picture of this impact. The second important point is that there is a centrally managed database, meaning that the metrics are stored in this database and this can be accessed by anyone. And this leads to the third important uh, feature, which is metrics is open source and community driven, based on open source principles. And this is key for us in Operas and key for what we propose in this project as well. It's an alternative to proprietary usage metrics, and this is very important. We have the community with us, and we're talking about open source here. This leads to the next one, which is the transparent processing. Uh, all the metrics that you can see uh, in this service, you can learn about the collection methods. You can understand how those metrics were gathered. This is all explained, and you can learn and understand where this information comes from. And finally, it's important to say that there is a widget, so the metrics can be displayed via any site, and it's very easy to interact and do analysis with this widget. But also, we have an option for publishers that can host the service themselves, and there is a dedicated support when this is the option. So at the end, what's important about metrics, it's the opportunity to valorize open access books. So it's a key, very important output, especially in the social science and humanities. We want to valorize these diverse outputs we have in, this, in our domain, and open access books are very key. So let's show how this work is being read. For example, if you are a university press, you can access and evaluate the impact of the open access books you've been publishing using metrics. But there are many other ways to use this service as well. As I said before, you can use the widget, you can aggregate the data, elaborate a very dash interesting dashboard. So there's many ways to show usage and impact of metrics, and this is what we propose with this service. And now I will pass the floor to my colleague, Maxim, because you can go even deeper on how metrics works. Thank you, Maxim, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot, Fotis and Carol. Um, so I will basically build up on your presentations, and I will um, I will uh, uh, uncover some technical details on uh, Opera's metric service. But before I go um, into detail, um, I would like to share some thoughts on again on why collecting data for monographs is uh, important. So depending on the type of audience, uh, we can single out the following needs. Um, we can say that researchers would like to know if others read their works. This is our researcher's ego and I myself, and I'm also very curious how many times my book has been downloaded or read. Uh, publishers uh, need to assess the popularity of the publications they produce. Um, platforms where the books are distribu distributed uh, need to evaluate the performance of their services. Uh, there are also funding funding bodies in this in this in this game. Uh, they can estimate where to put their money on. And finally, and I think the most importantly, the uh, research performing organizations, um, as we have heard from Carolyn Fortis, can use metrics for a responsible assessment 
for example, when hiring or promoting a researcher. And I think that's what it's, it's all about. Uh, we need fair and different assessment from from the ones which is going to take right now when someone is hired as a professor, for example. And um, when um, publishers talk about metrics, uh, they usually mean statistics taken there from taken from their own websites. Um, for example, uh, page visits or downloads. And um, this is because collecting comprehensive book metrics is a very difficult task. Uh, it's a challenging task and it is complicated by a number of factors. And these factors are the following. Um, the first one is the distribution. Open access books are disseminated across multiple platforms. Uh, the second one is identification. Uh, depending on the context, uh, the same work may have different URIs. Um, for example, uh, unique resource identifiers, for example, ISBN, DOI, or URL. Uh, the third is um, the third difficulty is usage. Uh, there is a diversity of parameters which can be monitored and methods to measure them. For example, there are views of the landing page, there are user sessions, there are unique users, downloads, shares, and so on. And the last but not least, this all goes into the quality of data that is reported back to the authors and publishers. And this data is not always consistent. So now um, let us take a look at uh, how the data collection by Opera's metric metrics works. We can distinguish between uh, four entities involved in the pro in, involved in this process. Um, the first one is the distributor platform. You see it on the left on the slide uh, where the book is disseminated. Um, the distributor can be, for example, directory of open access books or also Google Books. Uh, the data collection from the distributor platform is based on their on the uh, works DOIs. Uh, the second entity, uh, you see it in the middle of the slide, is the customer of uh, Opera's metrics. Uh, this is usually a publisher, uh, which may itself have a book uh, hosting book hosting service, meaning that in this case. Um, publisher can collect metrics from its own website as well. And uh, the data processing and normalization takes place on the customer platform. Uh, the third element of the infrastructure is the Opera's metrics service provider. Um, uh, it gathers all the data from customers, uh, enriches it with alternative metrics and stores in the central database. And finally, <clears throat> the, four, the fourth element in the picture uh, is the JavaScript widget located on the customer website. Uh, it gets the publisher-related data from the central database and displays it in a user-friendly way. So this is a kind of overall picture. And having had this um, overview, let us take a closer look at single steps involved in the process, involved in the in the process. Um, the first step, I call it get the data. Um, yeah, get the data. This is basically the data collection from the distributor. Uh, on the slide, you see the list of supported platforms among which um, there are open book publishers, Open Edition, OAAPEN, JSTOR, um, University Press Library Open, uh, and so on. A number, yeah, a number of platforms where the metrics collects collects uh, the data from. Um, the components responsible for the data collection are called drivers. Uh, you see uh, this word like on the on the on the left of the side of the of the slide. Uh, there is usually a driver dedicated to each platform um, and it collects uh, metrics uh, through the API calls. 
However, uh, book metrics may be gathered manually through the uh, CSV upload as well. And locally, in case, for example, the um, publisher has to monitor its own uh, website, um, um, they can uh, the data can be collected through the web, ser web server access log or using Matomo statistics. Matomo is a tool which basically which overviews the site uh, performance. Uh, after this, the data is taken over by plugins, uh, which process and normalize. Uh, it and in addition, there is a local database which stores the customer related data. Um, next slide, yes. So, in the step two, which I call here write the data, uh, step two is the communication between the customer platform and the operas metrics service provider. An important uh, element in this communication is the identifier translation service. Publications, as I have mentioned before, can have different type can have different types of identifiers. And you see in this example here, listed on the slide, the work um, uh, the work by Williams Saint Clair uh, has can have uh, has DOI, has uh, ISBN, and has also URL. And they all refer to the same work. So the task of um, identify a translation service is to aggregate all the URIs related to a work, and if necessary, to convert uh, them from one to another. And once the data is in the central Opera, Opera's metrics database, um, it is enriched with alternative metrics. It's also called alt metrics. Um, the alt metrics within, uh, within Opera's service uh, is based on cross, uh, cross ref relationships API, and it combines results from, um, uh, uh, combines results from hypothesis, WordPress and Wikipedia on annotations and uh, references. Okay, and the third and the final step um, is I call I call it read the data. Um, in this step, the data is sent back to the customer website and displayed in a widget. Um, the types of metrics displayed depend on the platform uh, they're collected from, but also on the wishes of the customer. Um, these are um, in uh, metrics slang. We call them measure measures. We call them measures. So these so-called like measures or, or parameters can be divided into core metrics and alt metrics, alternative metrics. The core metrics includes views, reads, sessions, downloads, citations, shares, but also users which is uh, particular for word, word reader um, uh, driver. The alternative metrics, and as I have mentioned before, um, includes annotations registered, uh, website annotations registered on hypothesis and references to particular work um, um, coming from Wikipedia or WordPress blogs. Um, Step. This final step can also be understood as a minimalist cost, as a minimal customer infrastructure. When, for example, the customer just has read writes from the metrics database, uh, it can retrieve and display the information uh, that they are interested in. They don't need to write into the database, but they can use the database itself just by reading it. Yes, so um, this was an overview of the whole system. And um, I hope I have shown you that uh, Opera's metrics service addresses all challenges which we mentioned uh, in the beginning, which are distribution, identification, usage, and quality. And the final note on the division of so-called on the division of labor for Opera's metrics. Uh, we, as a research infrastructure, provide the organizational framework to manage the service. 
the actual maintenance and development is done by Ubiquity Press with and additional support is provided by uh, open book publishers. And uh, in the next session, I think next hour, you will have a chance to get some hands-on experience uh, in using Opera's metrics from the Ubiquity Press uh, developers who are present here. Yes, thanks a lot. And um, if you have any questions, uh, we are open to answer them. Thank you, Max. And of course, uh, you can access the, the, the website to have more information. And if you want to get in touch with us, please send us an email and we'll be open to discuss any other doubts you may have as well, not only in this session, but at any time. Right, Fotis? Correct. Uh, so uh, I don't see any questions in the chat, but we do have uh, um, a menti prepared for everyone. Uh, you can either go to menti.com and just uh, add this code here, or you can use the QR code provided in this slide. Uh, we just have four questions, really, uh, just to navigate a little bit uh, a conversation around uh, what we just uh, listened. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll give everyone uh, a minute or so. So I will switch now to the Menti interface. You can still see the code once I present my screen again. But can I ask a question? Yes. Okay. About the metrics that the better metrics about the open access books, there is a list, there is only this in uh, this presentation where we can find them. Actually, sorry, I didn't understand the question. The metrics that you include in the Peras metrics about the open access uh, books, the content, and all this is this uh, that you introduce us in this presentation, or there is other? So, um, so the metrics, the actual metrics, are part of the database, um, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, the people from Ubiquity, uh, Rowan and Christian, will demonstrate in the next, in the second hour. So how you can access the data, how you can display them in in with the script that uh, was mentioned. Um, and I don't know and if that clarifies. Yeah, the information is also in the documentation. So uh, even in the website, you can see yeah. all the information. But you, in yes, it, mm -hmm. I can okay. say. Uh, if you can share the link in this chat, I think it will really be very useful for all of yes. us. Thank you, Carol. Yes, uh, thank you. Francesco already did that. He shared the page where we host uh, the information around uh, how to uh, work with Opera's metrics. Um, uh, there is a comment. Taking the long view, how sustainable and scalable is your service? How is it is to, is it to add other aggregator sources where all, all books uh, may be held? Thinking uh, of e.g. Toros open. Um, I think I think I can take the question yeah. if you don't mind. Yeah. Yes. So, I, I will introduce myself. I'm Francesco De Vigili. I'm the CTO at Ubiquity Press. And we've been working on the technical aspects of the Opera's metrics for a few years now. Um, so the, the metrics have been designed to be extensible. And uh, there is a long list of drivers which we'll be presenting in the next hour or so but also new drivers can be added. All of the code is open source and it's public available on uh, GitHub and GitLab. Um, so basically anyone who wants to create a new driver can just have a look at how this has been done for the existing drivers and try to you know, take inspiration from the structure and go to the documentation mm -hmm. and get in touch with us, of course, and we'll be helping the creation of new drivers. Um, on top of that, the main limitation for the creation of drivers is always the availability of the data. So as we will see in the next uh, 45 to 60 minutes, uh, Twitter or slash X is a good example of this. Uh, the API was publicly available for free 
for a long time. Um, so the project has been ingesting tweets uh, that were mentioning a specific DOI. And uh, so tweets is actually one of our measures. But then after the recent acquisition, the data source basically went away because the API is now extremely expensive if accessible at all. Um, so what we ended up doing is uh, keeping the old um, tweets in the database uh, because they were registered when the API was available. But now that the data source is not available anymore, we are not able to scrape new tweets. So this is an example of um, how the availability of data in the metrics is actually influenced by the availability of the data source itself. Um, we really hope that, um, and it, actually this only happened with Twitter, to be honest. Um, so we never had any other issue with any of the other data providers, including Google Books. Um, so with, um, with some luck, this will keep uh, being the case in the future. Um, but generally speaking, the creation of driver is open to anyone. The, the whole code base is completely open source. Um, the core language of the project is Python. And there is documentation to support. Ubiquity is always available uh, to support. And the wider Oblast community, I'm sure um, it's always available in different like, communication channels. I, I hope this answers the question. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you for this help. And there's another question, right? What is in the chat? Yes. Is there is uh, so uh, there's another question. There is the metrics only for books on social science and humanities area. Is there another platform for science books? I can I can very briefly answer this. If everyone's okay, and you can add correct me if I say anything that's not correct. Uh, what we mentioned earlier, it, it was a specificity that and a nuance that comes out of social science and humanities. But the tool itself is for any any book. It, it's not limited. The, there's no. It's not discipline specific. It's discipline agnostic. So. Uh, for example, um, uh, Ubiquity here can can speak to, can add to that as well. But when you publish with a specific publisher that uses the the, the widget metrics and the set the Opera's metric service, uh, it doesn't look at which discipline it comes from. It's mostly about the platform and whether you're using it. So if you publish an open access book in any discipline, uh, in any scientific area, then that can be uh, part of Opera's metrics. The just to clarify again, the SSH element is. Um, uh, we just mention it because publishing books is important for this uh, specific domain, as we've seen from, from research and from testimonials and uh, generally comments from researchers. So it's a priority for SSH. That's why we are uh, highlighting it. I would like to add uh, something about it. As yeah. what is. It's, it's important to understand this for our services as a whole. Uh, they are born from the needs from the social science and humanities. So valorizing open access books is key for social science and humanities. And if it's also a need for other domains, it's welcome. So the service is born within this context where there's a, there's a need for our domain, but it's normally very like open for being used for other sciences as well. Thank you, Carol. I think this uh, summarizes it uh, effectively. Um, and Francesco also uh, provided a list uh, of the, uh, the complete list of publishers whose content is available in the Opera's metrics. Uh, so thank you very much, Francesco. Um, oh, I get a 404 uh, error message on this page. Is it about the refresh uh, kind of thing, Francesco? Yeah, it's, it's a fairly new website. I will be answering um, on the chat right away. OK, thank you. Uh, while we do this, uh, how about we start with the mentee? Uh, do more people uh, want to join or not? I, I think we need to start it so we can also have a little bit of time for a quick break for everyone to go get the coffee and uh, before we start on the more technical and hands-on stuff of the second hour. So we just uh, designed a few questions to understand also the audience here. Um, uh, and we would like your thoughts first and foremost, uh, using one to three words to describe open access books. And uh, share a screen, do... please, Fortis. I am not sharing my screen. Oh, no, sorry. no. Yes, let's share, please. Sorry, I forgot. Great. <laughs> um, yeah. So let me just then, uh, do I need to put, can you put the code? The code is, yeah, six, five, seven, seven. <clears throat> Useful is great. So useful, it can be being undervalued, digital user, brilliant, digital. <clears throat> valuable, interesting. 
rare. I I know what uh, Maxim would like to add here, but uh... accessible. It's good. The future, mm, interesting one as well. True, rare, and rare. Let me see. I, I would be interested on, on whoever put too rare without putting you on the spot necessarily. Uh, if you would like to just expand a little bit what you mean by too rare, that there, there aren't many open access book, pub, uh, published open access books. Um, do you find it difficult to know how to publish? So that would be an interesting comment. Uh, and uh, I, I think now I see <laughs> what uh, Maxim would like to add. Uh, but uh, I saw you raise your hand. Do you want... Um, uh, uh, do you want to say something, Maxim, on this topic? Yeah, I thought I would be alone, but actually there's someone else who wrote that uh, sometimes too expensive. So I wrote expensive because, yeah, the, you know that uh, they charge you a lot for, especially uh, if, especially before the embargo period, for example, uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, the when you publish, it's one price, and then two years after, there's another price, and that's it's still extremely expensive. So interesting. Yeah, that, so, sorry, sorry for this. You can't no, say. no, no. Just, just, just to say that the uh, the price is is something that uh, it's also being discussed in open access journal articles, and I think yes, this is a very important topic, and I think. Uh, one of my slides that demonstrated the developing infrastructure, it's also, uh, you know, part of the activities I think in the future is to also to understand uh, what drives this kind of uh, costing and to make sure that we we have uh, fair prices uh, when it comes to open access books. But also uh, uh, there are plenty of ideas and solutions around how we uh, perhaps move to more, more, to more towards like the diamond uh, kind of uh, model that you see in general articles where you don't have to necessarily pay to publish open access. But this requires, of course, the necessary infrastructure, the, you know, uh, it still needs work to be done. But price is an issue. I agree with, with Maxim. Carol? Now we have, and we have the answer from Lucy. She was the one that wrote <laughs> to Rare. And mean that at the moment is not the usual way books are published. It should be the norm and not the exception. So we can also see some some lights here in this. Uh, and then Rupert uh, highlights that not all publishers charge uh, book processing art, mm -hmm. uh, fees for books. So let's see. Indeed. Yes, it's important point as well. I, I agree. That's why I mentioned it, that uh, although some charts, I think the diamond model is still uh, somewhere available. Uh, just uh, I don't want to point <laughs> to any publishers at the moment because I don't have a, a list in front of me. Uh, but thank you for the comments. And I think these uh, words, uh, I think it, we, need, we need some time to look at them. Uh, but it's very interesting to, to look at all of the responses. Um, but I, I really happy, I'm really happy to see the word brilliant, uh, transparency, uh, and unfortunately undervalued or underrepresented. Uh, but thank you for the responses. And I'm gonna, going to go to the next um, uh, question. And just, uh, does your organization have an institutional publisher? Um, uh, you may know this answer, you may not. Uh, just feel free to answer the way you, you, uh, you see it. And I think this question has different levels also. Uh, of course, um, for example, universities tend to have institutional publishers uh, at times. Uh, we know that, um, uh, but what we wanted to see is, is this uh, response and how it it will relate to the the one that we have next uh, on on our screen that will come once I click. I'm just waiting if anyone else wants to respond. Um, I think here, if uh, when I say does your uh, <laughs> Diamond icons, yes. Um, I think uh, what uh, I would like to say, so uh, feel free to respond to this question. Uh, I mean, you might be working for an open access book publisher uh, or, a, or a publisher. So I think here the response would be yes. So it doesn't have to be the, like, if you are part of an organization that has an institutional publisher. Uh, if you think that you are an institutional publisher, please, uh, you can respond yes. Uh, so thank you very much. And I think the more important uh, question that we need to answer is whether um, 
if you answered yes, uh, do you publish open access book? Does your organization, do you know if they publish open access book, if they have an open access book publishing policy? Um, and uh, that would be interesting to know. And uh, a resounding yes. So uh, that is good. That is good. I'm really happy to see that. And uh, if you want to just elaborate, if you have a link, if there is a policy that is public, if you if you want to just point us to which um, to which publishers you are talking about uh, in the chat, uh, would be very welcome to to get this data just so we have a picture of of uh, where these yeses come from. But uh, because today we're talking about uh, metrics, uh, we would really love your input on this question. What metrics are most important when it comes to open access books? We Maxim pointed quite a few, and you will listen about them a little bit in the, the second hour. So uh, we would really like, uh, I say choose up to three, I think uh, the multiple options that we have, uh, can you can provide even more than three. So uh, you can ignore the choose three, just to choose the ones that you feel uh, are more representative to this as a response. downloads mm -hmm. and I think this this question and I had a, an email exchange with uh, Elia Jimenez Toledo when we were talking about um, because I, I seeked her input uh, just uh, before this presentation uh, she has produced some uh, publications on this topic um, and what we discussed very briefly and she pointed out as, a, as an issue as a comment is uh, how do we know that a number is viable when it comes to metrics and it can be used, for example, in an evaluation? So that was a very important point. So when we choose and we say downloads are important, uh, why are they important and how are they important? And, and which point, uh, how do we compare the numbers? Uh, if we were to compare the numbers uh, when it comes to how many downloads we have, um, and uh, of course, uh, with citations, there is quite a bit of a culture in terms of uh, how citations are, are measured. We've seen with books, I think that they have a longer period in terms of what is valid and valuable because open access books uh, tend to have a longer uh, shelf life, uh, let's say, than journal articles. Um, interestingly enough, social media engagements are not uh, at the top of the agenda here, uh, nor Wikipedia or WordPress references. Uh, well. I don't have a comment on that unless someone else wants to say something uh, that you see here in this screen. Uh, if you want to comment, feel free to open your uh, microphone and just speak, uh, even from the audience. Uh, it's not just for the panel here. Uh, but I think we have a winner, a clear winner, downloads and then citations. Uh, ooh. Yeah. Changing very much. So, yeah. Uh, and the final question, and I think maybe we don't have enough time to discuss it in detail, but uh, we mentioned that, and effectively that links to what I said earlier. How do we use metrics responsibly in research assessment? Uh, I think it's a free uh, field where you can respond either. Um, uh, Rupert, uh, very good comment. The distinction between reads and downloads is tricky. I uh, concur. If anyone wants to, uh, more of our experts uh, on metrics here, wants to uh, add on this, feel free to. Uh, feel free to interrupt me, I mean, because I, I keep talking. Um, so how do we use metrics responsibly in research assessment? So I would really like to hear here some responses. Either put them in the in the menti or in the chat or as I say, raise your hand so we can have a conversation. First, we need those metrics to be accepted in research assessment, such like national goals. Okay. We need an O factor, openness factor, mm, a number of publications a researcher published in open access, adhering to the COARA, DORA, and National Research Assessment Guidelines. Okay. Not as the only aspect of research assessment. Indeed. Indeed. We are working deeply on this in this project. GraspOS is really focused on this as well. In my view, they shouldn't be used to access individual books. Just because a book has more reads, downloads, etc., doesn't mean it's better than another. It's an important point for the discussion as well. Uh, consider the quality of the research, research that is accurate, 
thorough, original, and relevant, which goes beyond those of citations. Yes. I like the get rid of them entirely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it gets you more and more. Not that there separate. is. There is... Though, to be honest, I uh, someone reached out to me on LinkedIn and actually uh, pointed to me a couple of uh, presentations, a couple of papers that have been written uh, that arguing about completely and utterly removing um, uh, metrics. Uh, I I still have to read them. I, I think I, I read it, but I'm not sure uh, I agree with all the points, and I and I don't think it's possible at this stage. This is a very uh, very interesting point of view, uh, which of course uh, I think I would like to discuss more, uh, but. Uh, and it's important to hear this kind of, 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 uh, of voices as well. Uh, I just yeah. want to point out that when we talk about, uh, for example, in my view, they shouldn't be used to assess, individ to assess individual books. Just because a book has more reads, downloads, doesn't mean it is better than another. I, I couldn't agree more in terms of having guidelines. And this is part of the work that we are doing in the SSH pilot uh, with Carol. Uh, and what we are trying to do, and we will have another validation workshop uh, at some point in 2025, is to actually produce a set, a set of draft guidelines for including metrics and research assessments uh, for SSH specifically, just to make it clear, uh, and also to uh, not confuse with a question about Selchuk uh, earlier. Uh, our pilot is about SSH, so we will um, uh, create guidelines for SSH. So it, it, we have to make sure that uh, to make sure that they are uh, used responsibly, that we have some sort of advice. Um, of course, this will be done in consultation with with uh, research and, uh, as I said, with validation workshops, so we can get the input from the community. It's not going to be done just by the two of us as individuals. Um, but let's see um, another or two responses. Uh, those who are assessed should choose the parameters. That's a very interesting point of view as well. Um, and I think this also uh, links to the narrative CVs that work that we're doing, where we say that, you know, the researchers should be able to demonstrate their work in their own uh, words, in, the, in their own uh, view, how they see themselves. Uh, and they should be able to, for example, to choose the parameters in this conversation. Uh, and if your program- In addition yeah. to this, what is, sorry to interrupt. In addition to this, uh, the scope method we are using uh, throughout the GRASPOS project has a very important point, evaluate with the evaluated. So we are trying to propose these new uh, forms to do research assessment within with the community, because it's exactly because they will be the ones being evaluated in the future. So it's very important to highlight as well. And also that all these answers we've been writing here, we will be taking this into consideration in our work. That's what we've been doing since the beginning. That's why we invite you to this kind of webinars and also the consultation workshops. We want to hear you and do this process with you. If I may, if I may just a final comment on the quality uh, uh, text here that we see, I think one of the conversations we have been involved is that how difficult it is to define quality from the perspective that quality can be seen differently in deeply, according to disciplinary context or methodological um, you know, differences. Uh, but I think uh, what we are at least trying to understand is whether quality can be defined by the processes. For example, as we mentioned earlier about PRISM, whether peer review can have provide insights into the quality of the uh, how a, pro a book, for example, was produced uh, and other kind of measures like that, that uh, effectively uh, aligned with the rest of the open science practices from maybe, let's say, one idea pre-registration all the way to having open methods, whether that could justify quality. But uh, of course, today we're talking about metrics specifically, and we need to understand whether uh, metrics uh, can have uh, a response to quality. And because we had this kind of response that uh, quality, unfortunately, cannot be measured by number. So I will close with this uh, as a, as a anti-climax, uh, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't have anything else to say. Thank you very much for engaging with with uh, with the mentee and providing responses. It was very useful. We would like to provide a five minute break, Zenia, correct? Uh, just before uh, we jump into the next session for people to have a refresher, a, a break. I would yeah. propose we go back to five. Is it okay for you? Six minutes? It's okay. Um, Ro and Christian, it's all good if you go back at two five and Zenia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I will not close the meeting, so... Yeah. So have your coffee. Do not leave us because the second part is going to be very interesting to understand more in detail how it works. So it can be a bit technical, but it's exactly why we are here, to explain and solve the doubts. So have your coffee and stay with us in five minutes. Thank, Thank you, Carol. You, Carol.
But they, we have a question, actually, I don't think it's a I, I see. I'm trying to, uh, to respond to it in I the chat that, because... I think we should uh, organize something about the quality perspective of all of this, of all this thing. It's very hot <laughs> and it's everywhere. Well, yeah, I agree. I mean, the, the thing I wanted to say to Solzuk uh, during this is um, the same questions apply for any kind of output, right? Uh, in general articles, we have this um, um, problem with paper mills where uh, people are outsourcing uh, writing articles to um, to companies, and then you have like this kind of fake papers that look like uh, actual papers, and they um, effectively they, they manipulate the, the the scholarly record in ways that can. Uh, of course, there are solutions. They, I mean, people are developing services to detect these kind of problems. Uh, but uh, yeah, the idea of quality is is uh, is very um, is very important. But I think that the data quality, I think uh, metrics is uh, doing its best the, the, as a service. I think when it was developed, I think they took into account how we can make sure that the data quality is is accurate, is good enough uh, to be to be used in this in this process. Um, but if people use AI to write books, this is something that needs to be detected. Uh, you know, it needs to be understood more deeply. And I think it's a different conversation. One, I'm not qualified uh, to answer. To be honest, um, I, I, I yeah. answered. I'm going to answer the first part of that question. Um, okay. From SP, there is also a second part, which is how do we make sure that people are not manipulating this. Um, these metrics. And that's actually, that's actually very interesting. And I think it will be mentioned at some point in, in Christian's slides, but um, the main answer to that question is that we, inside the Operas metrics, we run the same bot filtering that is uh, counter compatible. And the, the list of those bots is publicly available as an open source text in, in GitHub, so it can actually be analyzed and improved um, if there is any need. So bots will be filtered out. If you try to increase your numbers by using some sort of automation, that would be prevented by the bot filtering. And um, inside the Opera's metrics, we have very clear definitions of what we measure and how. So if you go on your book landing page, on your publisher's website, uh, if where the widget, uh, the Opera's widget is available, if you refresh the page 10 times in 10 seconds, that one will not be counted. So a lot of these measures are in place in the Opera's metrics to prevent people from um, abusing the metrics. Um, and all of this is clearly uh, defined in the definitions that we have in the, in, um, in the metrics portal. So if you, if you scroll through the different definition, you will see that uh, most of them contain um, clear details on what we measure, what we don't, and <clears throat> what we consider a session and what we don't. Thank you very much, Francesco. Thank you very much. It's uh, 2.05 and I think, uh, is that correct? Shall we um, yeah, can start. make sure that we start? Hello everyone, uh, my name is Christian from Ubiquity Press and I'm gonna uh, do the presentation. Um, let me share my screen. Can you see it all? Thank you. Uh, so the Opera's metrics offers a, a database of usage and impact information of published open access books. Uh, so it's obviously freely accessed as uh, my colleagues already said. Uh, it does give an us, uh, well, it has got an us, usage and all metrics platform for open access, access book, uh, content, sorry. Uh, it has got, is, is, is collecting from many different sources like OAPEN, uh, JSTOR, etc. Um, it was also part of the Hermios project with the European Funding Panda Horizon 2020, 
which uh, they, they, there, are, there is some open access uh, code uh, on GitHub. Um, and now is is continued uh, under Opera Plus, uh, and, and is maintained by Ubiquity um, as an open source and a fully managed service. Uh, this is just a very simplified uh, showcase of uh, all the metrics we collect. Uh, I have to emphasize, like Francesco said previously. Uh, the tweets are not collected anymore since it was uh, rebranded as X. Uh, but yeah, we still got all the historical data. And uh, on the on the right hand side, uh, we've got uh, all the sources we get the uh, metrics from, which uh, usually we've got a driver as you could hear before and um, and a plugin for them. Uh, these are just some numbers, uh, which they, they, they might be of interest for everyone, uh, like, uh, 84 different open access publishers, which are shared on the, on the, uh, documentation website. Uh, my colleague Francesco did already in the chat. Um, so the objectives and expectations, uh, you can perform simple. API queries, uh, which I will show later, obviously. Uh, you can uh, extract data using a Python script, which I've got uh, the script in the, in the next slides as well. Uh, just just export it as a CSV for, for analysis, uh, especially for researchers, uh, and explore the data to allow researchers uh, to get a bigger view of the, of the data, uh, as I said before. Uh, so this web binary is for authors, uh, which can embed the Opera's widget in their own website. Publishers, the same again, they can embed the widget in their own website because it's uh, free access anyway. Uh, but also it can con contribute data to the metrics database. And then researchers, uh, it will be more of a technical side, uh, just, just playing around with, uh, with scripts and and analyze data. Uh, this is a very simplified diagram the, of the same thing again, like uh, how how the author is going to interact with the metrics API, the book, the book publisher as well, and researchers. Uh, so as you can see, the the author is more like just a a read. Uh, they they will just have the widget. Then the publisher they can write, download views and reads to the metrics API. And researchers will be more uh, with uh, Python and scripts, They're just just for research purposes uh, and anal uh, uh, to analyze the data. Um, and yeah, some some interesting values like uh, we are serving around five million API requests requests per month. So if you are the author uh, or even the editor, uh, you can uh, have open, open access monograph edited volume which has been indexed in the Opera's web metrics. Uh, we are actually uh, creating a tool for this just to have an, uh, a UI uh, or user-friendly application for, for it. So yeah, uh, hopefully in the near future we've, we've got it running. Um, so obviously you can embed the widget and it's, the data is going to be refreshed every 24 hours. And what you need is, is just the DOI uh, of your book and uh, the widget instructions, which uh, we've got uh, we've got them in the documentation, obviously. Which this this is the link below. And yeah, let's let's dig into it. Uh, this is just a very it's just a sample of the of the widget. Uh, as you can see, all the values you've got the abstract. The views on top, uh, downloads, reads, citations, and tweets, and just a user-friendly map as well uh, with all the values, which is quite interesting. Uh, these are the instructions which which are extracted from the uh, documentation. Uh, it's, it's just a very brief, like very well. We narrow we, we we made it very simple from the. From, this, from the uh, documentation. 
but yeah, there is much more information in there anyway. Uh, this is how you install it. Just a very very simple way, which with, with well, it's only it's holding only one DOI anyway, uh, which is just simple HTML and JavaScript. Uh, which we've got the link as well to the repository. Um, so these are uh, different parts of the uh, widget as well. Uh, so you can customize it, um, it and it has got multiple options and settings. It's not just uh, just displaying information as it is. It's, uh, you've got multiple options anyway. Uh, and you can find them in the documentation. Uh, well, that, that will be the repository, but yeah. Um, so publishers, um, they, well, you've got the option as well to uh, not just to uh, display the metrics for a book. Uh, the uh, If you can see the works, the DOIs, you've got just the, let's say, BBC one as an example, and then the point A will be a chapter and the point B will be another chapter. Uh, so yeah, you've got uh, multiple options there as well. Uh, this is a sample. Uh, well, this is a sample of, a, of an academic, academic, sorry, website with a widget implemented, uh, which obviously you've got the link on the top as well. Uh, this would be an academic journal as well. Um, in this sample, on the right, you can see the tweets, and on the left, the citations. And then I'm gonna uh, give it over to to my colleague. Um, who is gonna do a presentation of the of the widget, like just the UI, the user friendly site. Over to you, Riz. Hi everybody. I'm Rhys. I created the widget using the APIs made available by Christian and Rowan. And I'm just gonna give a very brief demonstration about how the widget can be added with minimal kind of configuration. So I will just share my screen very quickly. So what we're looking at here is just a empty web page, and I'm just going to show you the code. It's you don't have to follow everything; just a very basic explanation. Uh, so we have a completely empty web page, which gets mimicked here. And on step two, all we've added here to this page, which looks like a lot more, is just copy pasted everything from the getting started page of the documentation. Which, by going to step two, we can see. The widget is trying to load, but we haven't yet added the configuration, which is probably the bulk of the widget. Everything else hasn't been changed. It's just been copy pasted in. So step three is where we just simply add the configuration, again, just from the documentation. And right now it's an empty object, which means the error has gone away, but we have no metrics to show yet. So what we'll do now is we'll add a simple, I say simple, uh, it looks more complicated than it is, um, configuration object, which simply says to well, if we look at it from this view, to get all of the works that have this DOI using the following measures, then we want to show those as a line graph as views over time. And if we add that, then we can see that the widget updates. And if we click it, we can see pretty much exactly that. And what this is, it's called a scope. And the idea of a scope is that we can group different measures together if we want to show them as part of the same metric count. So in this case, we're grouping up GA sessions and UP logs all to show in the same one count. Uh, if we do want to show different line graphs, for example, or different lines on the graph, we can make our config a bit more advanced by just adding a few more configurations. So what we've done here is we set the graph to show up as stacked, and we've split this up into now two separate scopes. So we're now putting UP logs as one scope and UPGA sessions as another scope. And what this will create for us is two separate views on the graph, which right now you can probably not tell the difference between which one is which. So what we can do is we can just add some very simple CSS, again, all from the documentation, which will style the different lines in the graph to be different colors. And we can differentiate between UP log views and UPGA. And we can do the exact same thing with other metrics or scopes as well. So this one, for example, is splitting up between chapters and the book itself. So we have one scope, which is for chapter views which again takes the GA sessions and UP log sessions and another one, which is for the book views. So we're uh, sorry, the chapter views. So we're using all of the chapter DOIs here, whereas here we're just using the book DOI. 
And then if we were to look at that one, we can again see we have a book views graph and a chapter views graph. And that's a very small guide on how the widget can be implemented. Back to you, Christian. Thank you, Riz. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen again. So now we we are uh, going over the uh, what what the researchers can do. Can you see my screen? Maybe not. Uh, we we could before as well, so we can yeah we can yeah, see no. it now. All right, yeah, I can see it now. Sorry, I couldn't see the see the small pop up in the screen. Um, so yeah, this is a very simple example of uh, making a API call uh, to the measures, which is available, is publicly available. I could show you right now. Uh, I've got it open here, for example. If I refresh, it, it's gonna be ugly, but uh, this is a long list of measures, for example. Um, so um, so yeah, that's, for example, the measures. Uh, then uh, you can get a DOI as well and uh, make an API request to it as well, to the Crossref. Um, then we've got, for example, the citations, which is very popular, as you could see previously. Uh, it's, it's, again, the same API call. It's just a different endpoint uh, with the DOI at the end of it, the, the one you just got from the last slide, let's say. Um, and then I'm going to give a very simple demo of a Python script, uh, which I created, and how to export it as a CSV as well, the results, and just 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 to display them on Google Sheets and maybe do some analysis with it. Uh, so bear with me. Can you see my code? Uh, not yet, no. OK, let me share it again, just in case it's not. Yes, I think this will be it. Can you see it now? I I see a black screen. <laughs> yeah, All it right. says Christian Garcia has started screen sharing, but I don't think we see it at the moment. Yeah, one more time, please. Yeah, I'm gonna try again. Sorry, guys. That time is a charm. Yeah. Yeah, can you see it now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Good. Um, so yeah, this is a very simple script which you've got the DOI on the top. It's just a variable. You use the, the same DOI we, we showed in the presentation as an example. Um, and then, <clears throat> sorry, it's gonna it's gonna make an API call. It's the same as I showed in the browser anyway, but just in Python code. Uh, you can see the the URL here with the DOI as a variable. Uh, and then it's just uh, this this is just to combine the last name and initial because otherwise it's gonna it's gonna be quite ugly it's gonna separate it in be like a list of dictionaries but you can uh, ignore that for now and this is the main function which is gonna do all the work really uh, so and it's gonna save it's gonna uh, create a pandas data frame which is uh, I think is very well known in between researchers and then it's gonna just save it to the CSP. Uh, that's 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 all. And if I execute it, um, as I as I've got it here, the output the output files it should create an output CSV basically. Uh, so I'll execute it, uh, and then it's saved here. It's quite ugly here, but I've got the actual version in uh, Google Docs. Uh, which will be something like this. Uh, you've got the authors, uh, the editors, which there is no for this, uh, the, the year, which, I mean, was performed, the citation, and the title of the book, the source, uh, volume issue, the page, the UI, and the type. And um, you can imagine you can do uh, a lot of um, data analysis with this, like uh, order it by year or how many you had for for 2020, for example. Christian, um, sorry, so sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, I think um, you're not sharing the Google Drive uh, screen. Yep, I guess sorry. It's the... okay. sorry, yeah, I'll do that again. Uh, 
Is that okay? Yes. Great. Sorry for that. Uh, yeah. So this is this is the the, the Google the, the Google Docs uh, Google Sheets example, uh, which I just extra extracted with my Python script. Uh, so you've got the authors on, on this column, editors not not for this at the moment, but yeah, uh, and the year of each citation was created uh, with the title of the book. Uh, you've got the source, uh, the volume, uh, the issue, the pages, even the DOI, if you if you need to play with it as well. So, like I was saying, uh, you can imagine you can do some uh, analysis with it. Uh, like, for example, uh, for one specific year, just showing a graph of like the citations for for it. Uh, and yeah, uh, that's that's about it from me. Uh, this is the last, <laughs> the last slide. I don't know if you can see it. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> uh, okay. And yeah, yeah, and this is just the, again the, the the metrics operas documentation, which has been shared already in the chat. Uh, the GitHub repository, which I mentioned at the beginning uh, when it was here, news. And yeah, for any for any questions uh, outside of this call, obviously you can just send me send in me an email. Um, that's all about me. Thank you. And um, the opera's presentation. Um, I, I'm just going to add a couple of points at, at, at the end of this. Um, everything that we've seen so far, which uh, Reese and Christian kindly shared, um, it's completely, completely open source. So all of the code for the widget, all of the code of the opera's metrics is publicly available. Um, the way the measures are created and the way the metrics are registered is very, very well documented. And we have clear definitions for all of these metrics. The list of bots, which I mentioned earlier, um, which would be filtered out to the metrics is publicly available. Um, and the, the, the most important part is the data is publicly available. So all of these API endpoints that we've seen, which we, I think, of course, more interesting to researchers and publishers, but all of these API endpoints have, have been open for years now. So all of this data is public. It can be accessed by anyone. It can be extracted by, by anyone and reused in, um, in many possible ways. The other point that I think it's worth stressing is that this data will always be, be available for free. So there is no willingness or um, in, intention to sell this data at all. And, um, and will always be freely available. And the way this can be accessed uh, depends on the kind of usage that one wants to make. Um, the widget is talking to the API. Um, so the widget can be embedded into pages, but the API is always free and publicly, publicly available. Um, it is currently maintained by Ubiquiti. So the, the world infrastructure is hosted by Ubiquiti. But the project is, is up there on GitHub and GitLab and can be really self-hosted by anyone who's willing to tackle the technical challenge. Um, otherwise, otherwise um, all, all the data is there and can be freely downloaded through, through the API or freely displayed through the widget, which is open source as well. Thank you, Francesco. Uh, I would like, because we have some time ahead of us, and I think we, we more or less finished the, the demonstration a little bit uh, earlier than uh, expected, uh, I just want to uh, ask anyone in the audience if they feel like they would like a Christian to just demonstrate again something live, uh, if they felt like um, something that was of interest and they would like to see it again just a, a bit, uh, so just so we, you know, um, focus on, on how to do uh, some of the steps again, because there is some time to do that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I have a couple of, uh, you know, uh, looking at it because I, I'm not an expert on Python or, or any programmatic language, uh, programming language. I, I just need to ask, um, and of course, I may be a way of, uh, of target here, but let me, I will just say, uh, a, are any of these scripts like available? Um, oh, there is a question in the chat. So before I say anything, I will just uh, 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 say out loud what uh, Selzuk is writing in the chat. If I want to create a dashboard that will be publicly available, 
that is showing metrics for some organization in our country, for instance, will I still be able to use the APIs freely or is it free only for personal use? Um, the, I'm, I'm going to take this straight away. The answer is mm -hmm. always yes. The, the API is freely available in every possible sense, not just for personal use. Um, you can extract the data, you can build dashboards, you can use the widget, you can take the data and use them in any way you like. Um, we, I, I would really love to encourage people actually to use it um, because it's, the data has been freely available for years. And I, I know that there, there, there are so many possible interesting applications and uses for them, for this data that um, could possibly come out um, with the integration of dashboards and other, other tools. Um, if I had to make a recommendation on one way to create dashboards, I think it will be through Streamlit, which is a very interesting Python library to create uh, dashboards. And it can ingest data from, from APIs as well. I, I will try to send a link uh, later on. That's one of the tools that uh, we've been exploring over time to extract data from the API and build dashboards in Python. Uh, but the main point is the API is always, is always free. Um, there would be, I think a conversation about how many requests one can make um, to the API. This API is currently serving 5 million API requests per month. Um, so it's, uh, it's quite a volume. It's not huge, but it's certainly not um, a small amount of traffic. And this is currently supported by the ubiquity tech team. So if, you have, if you're thinking of making more than a few hundred of thousands requests, uh, it would be interesting to have the conversation uh, beforehand, but for a normal usage, like embedding widgets or extracting content through scripts, um, for a normal user, I think it's completely fine to just um, go ahead. And uh, to, and Rupert also says in the chat that uh, as another example, uh, Open Book Publishers has created a separate widget, also open source, but works in similar fashion. So it shows you that uh, uh, it's it's open science at its best, let's say. Um, I think when you're selling things open source, then you have uh, different solutions that you can implement. Uh, and um, this is a uh, great, great work. Um, just to say, Maxim also asked a question. Could you share a couple of API calls to the metrics database so that the participants can try them just inserting their own DOIs? Uh, uh, if they definitely. Have any? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's a really good uh, point. Rob, Robin and Christian, do you want to come up with um, a couple of samples using any random DOI? And maybe you can just uh, pass the URL into, into the chat when you're in your Yeah, yeah. we'll do. Thank you. So there is already one, one from uh, Christian. Uh, does someone want to share their screen uh, to manage this just uh, so people can see what uh, we're doing? And, and I will come back to my point uh, about uh, earlier about, uh, and let's be honest here and just uh, say uh, if someone has, um, so for example, for an institution to, to implement Operas Metrics, I think you can always find someone in the IT department uh, that probably will have some knowledge of, of uh, this kind of language where they can work with the, with the, with the web pages. So what if someone has, um, if, it's, if it's an individual or something like that, that they want to install this, would there be any automated kind of, uh, let's say, uh, because I've seen this with other open source documents where I manage with very limited loaners through the documentation to just, you know, download the right Docker or the right uh, script and just install it with very few easy steps. Do you think this is possible also for this uh, kind of application for metrics? So if a researcher wants to install it, they can follow uh, four or five easy steps. Uh, is this ready or is it planned to be uh, prepared in the next uh, two months or so? So the, the good news is that um, if you if you look at the open source code base for the um, Opera's metrics, we also run the services with Docker ourselves. So I know, I know this conversation now is getting a little bit technical, but Docker is just a very simplified way of packaging application and running them uh, locally or in the cloud. We use Docker ourselves. Um, so the, the Docker, let's call it recipe for running the application comes as part of the open source code base. So if you add into the code base, you find Docker files, um, and using those Docker files, you should be able to just build a Docker container, which means that you avoid 
having to set up everything from scratch and, and run your application. Um, at this point, it may be maybe what maybe worth pointing out that um, the Opera's metrics is actually a small ecosystem of different applications. So there are, there are at least three different applications which we haven't really uh, shown just to simplify the conversation a little bit, but there is the alt metric service, uh, which is responsible for collecting the alt metrics, the metrics API, which is responsible for serving the API calls that we've seen in this, in this presentation. There is something called the identifier translation service that translates uh, the identifiers. So from ISPN to the UI or from the DOI to the URL of the landing page of a book. Um, so these are the three main services and each one comes with its own Docker file. So that will help people who want to run these services to um, set it up locally. Um, and we are always open to, to help out people um, to set them up locally and or possibly in the cloud. Um, if I had to bring our experience as the um, institution hosting this for other partners, we, we run them as token containers into Kubernetes, but it's, it's some sort of like um, a very large production grade infrastructure that I, I understand that um, not many people may have access to. But that's okay. Thank you for this explanation because uh, all in all, we did say, first of all, most, the, the, the webinar is recorded. So people can run back to the recording and they can explore some of these terms if they if they need to. And I think that's also the useful thing with the demonstrations Christian's made. So uh, I think people can take their time if they want to do this step by step outside of this uh, hour, let's say, so they're not stressed to do it. Uh, but also we did, I mean, training has an element of, of technicality that uh, we cannot avoid. And I don't think we want to shy away from it as well. Uh, and that's why we, we are here to help them as well. If anyone needs, I mean, they can contact you or Opera's metrics, as we said in the previous uh, hour. Uh, and I just want to build on what, uh, and Francesco, if you can change your, uh, when you respond to the chat, because uh, I sent you a personal message earlier. And then uh, when you're responding, the messages are coming to me. So I've been uh, putting in the chat uh, what you're responding to, because you're responding to me. If you change it to everyone, then um, you will be able to respond again to uh, Selchuk directly. Uh, I'm sorry, oh, this apologies. was my mistake. Uh, yeah, yeah, really, yeah, really sorry. I didn't realize. Sorry, that that's okay. Yeah. Uh, but sorry. I just wanted to add to what Selchuk is uh, suggested, for example, as an idea earlier. And I think these are the things, uh, and Carol can also uh, share her ideas here. Uh, when we're looking at the SSH environment and generally how we assess open access books, and, and this is part of the conversation about how do we evaluate open science practices in general. So when something like data, uh, I mean, you can have sensitive data and you cannot really expect everyone to share their data according, you know, specific to research, uh, according to the discipline. Uh, so you cannot, let's say, um, assess individuals uh, in the same way across different disciplines uh, when it comes, for example, how open the data. But, and this was part of a conversation in, in one of, on the consultation workshops, is that you can assess uh, an institution if they offer the, the infrastructure to make um, the data open and whether as an institution as a whole, if they are progressing in sharing more data openly. Of course, now we have uh, research security questions. So I, I will transfer the same uh, rationale to the open access books. So I think it's important, and this also links to the things that were mentioned in Menti, how we assess individually someone and how we assess organizations or regions or the EU as a whole is how we we need to be to think very carefully um, uh, about what we include in these kind of assessments. And, and I'm coming back again to what I said with Carol earlier, that we are thinking very deeply about what is a good guideline when it comes to assessing people, but we cannot assess individuals and organizations in the same way. But I, I do think, and I do believe that it's a very interesting way of looking at uh, institutional publishers. Uh, and that was also another comment by Ella Jimenez Tolevo in the, the chat, in the email that we exchanged, is whether an open access publisher, if, if, if a publisher uh, demonstrates some commitment towards open access, if they are, uh, you know, even if they haven't been publishing open access in the beginning, whether they are progressing towards that kind of uh, transition. So this kind of commitments uh, are also important to assess uh, more widely, um, uh, uh, you know, when we are assessing open access books. I don't know if, Carol, you want to add something to what I just said? Um, 
uh, just uh, reinforcing again, I always come back to to what scopes with our like framework for working with research evaluation, which is context matters. So the evaluation, uh, the type of evaluation should consider the context. And sometimes this is domain, sometimes it's individual or organizations. So context should matter when we think about research assessment. I think it's such an important point to always remember. Uh, also, we are uh, here is Julia in the chat uh, saying that she will follow up with integration with other services in GRASP-OS. So just remembering as well that we are talking about metrics here uh, within the context of GRASP-OS, which is building a huge framework with diverse services. So we are also thinking of this broader context in GRASP-OS as well. And uh, we've talked about that uh, on, you know, um in a more uh, you know abstract way so far uh, whether for example uh, graspois has uh, the open air graph uh, and i think that was one of the things that i always want to explore a little bit more and understand whether the metrics and the data included in metrics whether they can be structured um, in a way that can be part of a knowledge graph so that was uh, that was always in my mind because uh, precisely for what Julia says, because we need to see how they can be integrated in other services. And we also have monitoring solutions within GraspOS, uh, primarily offered by OpenAir. And um, so there are definitely things that are in the pipeline from the project perspective to be, um, you know, uh, more research to be done in, in the final year, which is 2025. So we still have a year ahead of us uh, with further developments. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't have anything. So the maxim is still in the chat uh, with the DOI being, uh, will the API call can be? Uh, maxim, uh, do you sorry. want to just, yeah. Uh, just my private, sorry. I just wanted kind of my individual interest, not private, individual interest to 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 how to, uh, how to acquire the API, so. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm 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 answering, I'm answering that question right. now. Yeah, yeah, I try, I try, I try. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Try, it's that, nothing. So maybe you can maybe comment on this list of the of the publishers you also, or you mentioned before, because I guess I I mean we have to clarify, we have to kind of maybe make clear that not all books of these publishers are in the database. No. Yes. So. Uh, um, at some point in the recent past, um, we started running these, um, this service called uplopen.com and is basically a large portal that contains many, many open access books from academic institutions all over the world. A lot of them are from the United States. Um, as part of this website um, and as part of all the services that Ubiquiti offers, we uh, are, have plugged the Operas metrics in it. So we are now registering uh, metrics um, for all the open access content that is available on the website. And this is um, why the, um, the database contains uh, metrics from many different publishers. So summarizing, the reason why we have so many publishers in the database is because the, the Opera's metrics are plugged into the website where these books are available. Um, and this is also true for other open, open access content distribution systems. Um, so there are open partners who also have websites where books are available for reads, downloads, open access books, of course. And um, for all those websites, we collect metrics in the Opera's database. And since these this books may be from more than one publisher, um, this will also mean that many publishers will have some books into the um, Opera's metrics database. In the case of very specific um, open access publishers like Ubiquiti or OBP, um, this is even more true in the sense that most of their books, if not all of them, are actually in the Opera's metrics um, database. And I can see a very comprehensive message from Rowan with some examples of the API queries as well. Um, I also asked if you could go, if we could go live to a page where we can see uh, the live demonstration of a widget, because I've, I've seen in previous meetings with you, Francesco and uh, Christian and Rowan, we, I mean, some pages have like very nice, uh, robust data from the different kind of metrics that you collect 
can we share the screen or a link from a from a live uh, publisher catalog or um, something like that now to just um, share it with uh, with people? Um, yeah, definitely. I, I will I will be sending around um, a few links. Um, the uplopens.com is the first website that comes to my mind, but this is planned in across hundreds of websites uh, for different yeah. academic presses, academic journals and academic repositories. One of the things that we haven't mentioned, again, to, to simplify the conversation is that um, the Opera's Magic System was born from the SSH community and it was initially intended to um, measure these metrics um, on open access monographs or edited volumes um, and then technically expanded uh, to basically all access, all, all open access content. So it, it's also now including uh, metrics and content from open access journals and um, open access academic repositories. Um, the only limitation is, of course, all the content, including the open source metrics database, is academic, and that's something I I need to stress. <laughs> it's uh, it's very specific to the to the academia. Um, I will be sending other links into into the chat with some examples to um, of the metrics on on different. So projects. if if uh, if I may, um, I'm just trying to find uh, because I just want to show also because OBP mentioned earlier that they have the same uh, kind of uh, tool that they've developed their own uh, kind of uh, version of it. If you can, I found one book from uh, Open Book Publishers. If you can have, if I can have just one uh, book from UPL Open, so I don't. I can share my screen then and just showcase a little bit uh, how they look. Um, so why, uh, why don't I see any data? Oh, they will, they will come up soon, I think. Okay. Um, ah, there it is. Okay, let me just share my screen really quickly then. Just to showcase what we are uh, talking about and, and how that really feels looking at it uh, from live. This is from uh, the Open Book Publishers. So I just click on the first book. So uh, it's not really, really like a, uh, a choice by any uh, you know criteria or anything. But you can look here, for example, um, uh, the Google Book Views or OBP downloads. So you can uh, separate precisely what's uh, where the downloads are coming from or the timeline, which uh, uh, most of them come in 2024. And also, I think this is specifically for 24 because it was published in 2024. But you can also see the geographical uh, breakdown uh, as well and uh, some more information about the measures and the full report, which I think it might actually uh, take me somewhere else, but that's fine. And now, for example, from the example that um, uh, Francesco shared, if you want to just uh, say anything about what we see here, but you can see also uh, citations, uh, for example. Uh, and effectively, we go back to the screens that um, uh, that we were shared earlier by Ubiquity that you can see how things look. Um, uh, so you can see Wikipedia articles, for example, where this book is mentioned in Wiki in Wikipedia. Uh, you, or uh, yeah, yeah. If, if you go to downloads, I think uh, there are a few interesting comments to be made. Um, so the the downloads, it, the graph is showing the cumulative amount of downloads from different sources. So the uh, blue area at the bottom. This is book downloads from Google Analytics um, because the Google Analytics contained data about this book. So this data was imported. Um, we then, disc um, a few years ago, actually a couple of years ago, we discontinued the use of GA in order to be GDPR compliant. Um, so that's why that blue area, it's flattening at some point in time because no more data from GA was collected but the historical data of the downloads from Google Analytics was collected, is in the database, and is still available in the graph. Um, the book is also available on OAPEN, and this means that we are getting all of this data from OAPEN, who is kindly sending the data to, uh, to the OPERAS metrics. And, um, and so this data is available in the database, and it's shown in the, gray, in the, gray, sorry, in the green area of, of the graph. And then the book was recently made available on UPLO. So the purple section of this graph is showing the, the, the downloads from UPLO itself. And this explains why uh, the purple area starts very recently 
in, in 2024. That's because that's when the book was made available on UPLO. So the downloads of this book, they are basically coming from three different sources. And, and that's why um, I'm, I'm very proud of what the Operas, um, is, what, what the Operas Magics are doing, because it's, it's really showing a full perspective of, on the downloads and, and the views and the other metrics uh, from different sources and all combined in a single um, visualization that are quite easy to interact with. Can I add something? Um, yes, if indeed. you go uh, below here, Operas Definitions, and you can see below the, the, the graphs, uh, 40s here, uh, what are talking about the, the transparency of the information. So if you, click, if you click there, you can see information about, yes, so a bit more of the sessions and so more information about the metrics, which is important for us as well. To explain yeah. and what... Why... Say, say, yeah. say, say. So, sorry to jump in. Yeah, and one of the interesting points to be made about these definitions is that um, if you go to the views of downloads definition for the different kind of metrics that we have, you will notice that the definition of how the Google Analytics downloads were registered is different from the definition of how the other downloads were registered. And this goes to show that we try to make it very clear how each of these numbers was registered. And, and this is the same for all the different data sources that we have. So each data source comes with its own definition that clearly explain the logic behind the collection of this data. We have another question uh, in the chat. Yeah, can we see the citations item by item or only total? So effectively, can we know who has cited by this data? No, I think. I, I have very interesting games. Uh, this is going to go live uh, next week. So we are going to release a new version of the widget where the details of each citation will be available just below the widget, item by item. Um, it was in a plan for this week, but we didn't manage to roll it out before the call. I'm sorry. Okay. So this is an interesting question. If there are updates like this, uh, does somehow it affect if someone uh, do they need to do something specific uh, if I ha if I already have installed the version of the widget? Do I need so to do something the, about it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this would be a question for our front-end developer, Rhys, but I think I can, I can also take it. So the when Rhys was screen sharing um, his configuration of the widget, a lot of the widget code is boilerplate. So it can be copy-pasted from the documentation and added into the page. What really changes is the configuration of the widget. So that we, tr we try really hard to make um, that configuration very stable. So what happens is that if a new version of the widget is released, your old configuration will still be valid. Um, and I don't think ever happened that um, the widget was broken because a new version was, was released. So we are always trying to make new versions compatible, compatible with your existing configuration. What will change is that new version of the widget may need some additional configuration for the new feature. But um, as far as we're concerned, new new releases of the widget happens every every month, almost every couple of months. So it's, the, pro the project is very active developed. Um, and we will always try to make the new versions compatible with the older version of the configuration. Thank you very much. Um... There's another question. So what does downloads, uh, press logs mean in the Opera's definitions? Uh, yes. So let's press logs. Okay. So the, this is the definition how a download is registered by Ubiquiti. And one of the things that was clear when we started working on the um, on the Opera's metrics is that since these books are available on different websites, um, in the case of this book, uh, the book is available on UPLO, on the Ubiquiti website, um, well, the, on the UCP Press, really, University of California Press, and on um, OAPEN, potentially. So different websites will be registering downloads in different ways. And this all, all goes back to the transparency of the metrics. So we need a different definition for every data source. So a book downloaded from the University of California Press website, uh, it, it is still a download, of course, but the way this is counted may be different from how Ubiquiti counts a download. And that's why we have different definitions for every 
for every um, data source. And to, to go back to the question, uh, press logs means that this is um, a download registered by um, Ubiquiti. So by the logs of the press, um, which is basically UPLO in this, in this example, uh, which is different from Google Analytics and is different from Waven. Thank you for this question, Peter. Uh, any other, that, that, did, did that clarify it? I hope, yes, Peter, if not, please let us know in the chat. Uh, and any other questions? So what we try to do here uh, is to maybe ask as many questions as possible. So people, when looking back at the recording, uh, they can get more insights. And of course, um, as I said, because a few people had to go, then maybe they want to complete the, um, the training on their own time. Uh, but also we, we would like to share this, you know, more widely uh, for those who couldn't attend as well. Uh, any other uh, thoughts, uh, comments, um, questions? Uh, Maxim. Yeah, because referring to the to the uh, what Peter Potter also asked, press logs. I think uh, sometimes the uh, definitions uh, are quite are not kind of on this not obvious uh, obvious. Because, for example, press. As far as I understand, you see press. Uh, Google Analytics press uh, logs. Press refers basically to the publisher, and uh, logs means the server access logs, something like this. So maybe I mean the abbreviations you have under the under the picture now, under the Opera's definitions, and then you have the abbreviations. They're kind of not not self-explanatory, so it's kind of difficult sometimes to understand what is meant. Once you explain it, it's clear. Yeah, you explained what, we had, what, what does. We had, a good, yeah. we had a good deal of, thanks for this, Maxine. We had a good deal of conversation with um, with the people behind UPLO on how we can make this kind of definitions um, and widget as, as clear as possible. So this is uh, very much still of a work in progress. Um, I, you may want to discuss this with Peter as well, uh, Peter Potter, who I think we'll be interested in getting some feedback. But the interesting part of this, at this point, is that as Reese was showing earlier, if you embed the widget um, in your website as an author or as a publisher, you have full control on every single aspect of, the, of, the, of this widget. So if you want to change um, GA in this, in this example to Google Analytics, just to make it clear, you can. So all of this is basically just configuration of the widget that we decided to uh, make it look this way, but it can it can possibly look in all kinds of different ways as you customize the configuration of the widget. So there is no strict requirement for um, to stick to any specific look and feel. Say, and this goes uh, this applies to the colors, um, to the different graphs, the shades, the CSS of um, of the widget, anything really. And uh, Sai just responded to one question by Ursula. Uh, I saw that the view Opera's metrics is also included in GoTriple. Why can't I find all OA books from OA Open Library in GoTriple? And the simple answer is that uh, yes. GoTriple filters only for SSH content. Uh, it's an SSH discovery uh, platform. Exactly. Platform. Just want to to reinforce this point is because uh, GoTriple is specifically like designed for social science and humanities content. So this is an important feature for that platform. Uh, although it's a multilingual platform, so we can find different sources in different languages. But yes, there, there's a specific filter for SSH there, and that's the reason why we can find all the books there. Thank you, Carol and Sai, for responding to the comment. Um, and Peter now, uh, I think he's, uh, it's more clear to Peter as well what we he was trying to say, and uh, with the clarifications by Maxim and Francesco. So uh, I don't have anything else to add. Uh, it's five minutes to uh, three. Uh, I don't know if Zenia, do you want to uh, Just offer to some? Thank you, all. <laughs> thank you all for this informative and insightful presentation. And uh, if you don't have a problem, I will follow up with an email with the recording and the presentation. If you want to uh, copy paste your emails, if anyone have any questions so they can contact you directly if you want. Um, this is all for me. And also feel free to reach out to us through our email. I can put it down again in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, if you need technical support, 
and we'll be always open to talk to you and discuss not only doubts, but broader as well, the topic of open offices books and metrics. When we talk about operas, we talk about the open parts, very important. So this is a community-driven research infrastructure. So we, we need you to keep going, developing the services. So comments, doubts, critics are all welcome for us to keep developing our services. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, I'm also, uh, because Ursula is continuing effectively the conversation a little bit and says, how is a book tagged as a, as a SAGE content in the OAPN library? Uh, but I don't think this is a question that we can or should respond at this moment. But I'm asking Ursula if you want to add your email in the chat. If you're not comfortable, uh, you do have the technical uh, email now from Operas if you want to just uh, put the question there. Uh, or I think, uh, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, uh, when we're, maybe we can edit the page or not. Uh, yeah, I don't see our email contacts there, but uh, yeah, but you, there is now the, an email in the chat, uh, but I'm also going to put mine as well, if you just want to reach out to a person uh, specifically to continue this conversation, uh, or if you write. Um, okay, Ursula, thank you very much. Uh, we can continue this conversation offline. Thank you. And also, uh, this presentation, right, Tsenia, uh, will be available in Zenodo. So all the emails, all this information will be there as well if you want to go back not only to the recording, but also to the slides that will be mm -hmm. available very soon in Zenodo. Yeah, yes, I do. Perfect. Thank you. And Francesco no, provided no. his email as well. Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.